Welcome back to the Parasitology Lecture Series. In the next few videos, we will be talking about parasites and the immunocompromised, particularly the parasitic ciliates. What are the parasites of the immunocompromised? We will be discussing these four important parasites in highlight, Cryptosporidium, Cyclospora, Cystoisospora, Toxoplasma, but I would have to mention that there are a lot of other parasites more often than not associated with immunocompromised people. These would include strongyloides, leishmania, and plasmodium, which we will not be discussing in this lecture series, but it will be discussed in further lectures. As I mentioned, we will be focusing on these four ciliates, and these all belong to the superclassification of protists belonging to the phylum apicomplexa, class coccidea. Some of them are monoxinous, and some of them are heteroxinous. Monoxines are parasites with only one host. These would include cyclospora, cystoisospora, and cryptosporidium. While heteroxines would have two hosts to complete their life cycle. And among these four, this would include toxoplasma. Please remember that all of these four are eukaryotes. These are multicellular organisms. They contain organelles and they possess complex metabolic processes. As you can see in this taxonomic classification, they all belong to class coccidia, and they are all eukaryotes. Now let's go to the first parasite, cryptosporidium. From this slide, please focus on the highlighted words. You have your waterborne, cryptosporidiosis, prolonged diarrhea, municipal water treatment plant, Control of raw water quality. So these are the important terms that you have to keep in mind um, during the course of this discussion. The causative agent for cryptosporidiosis is a protozoan from the genus Cryptosporidium. We have two important species of Cryptosporidium to discuss, which includes Cryptosporidium parvum, which primarily creates zoonotic infections, and you also have your Cryptosporidium hominis, which is the human to human species. This is the life cycle of Cryptosporidium. Cryptosporidium has a very simple circular life cycle. It ingests the infective stage, which is the thick walled oocyst. It goes down to your gut, where it multiplies in your small intestines, and you excrete thick walled oocysts. And then you get exposed to the infective stage when you are exposed in contaminated surroundings, which completes the life cycle. Now let's zoom towards what happens inside your intestines. Inside the gut, cryptosporidium develops within the parasitophorous vacuoles, oh, that's a mouthful, or your PPVs. And these are within the microvilli layer or the brush border of your intestinal epithelial cells. You have the asexual cycle where they just multiply through binary fission, and you also have the sexual cycle which are composed of gamonts and gametes, eventually forming a zygote here. During infection and reproduction, endogenous intestinal stages occur within the parasitophorous vacuoles, and this would cause microvilli layer destruction and atrophy, which would eventually lead to impaired glucose and electrolyte transport, impaired carbohydrate and protein digestion, and manifesting with primarily malabsorptive and maldigestive disease. Please take note of the presence of the already sporulated oocysts coming out from the zygote, whether they exit the host or they remain within the host for autoinfection. The symptoms of cryptosporidium really depends on what type of patient it infects. In immunocompetent patients, cryptosporidiosis is usually asymptomatic, and if it becomes symptomatic, it would develop as profuse watery, foul-smelling diarrhea, which can last from days to even weeks. And in some patients, they would develop into asymptomatic carriers. In immunocompromised people, and these usually are the patients with CD4 counts dipping below 200, they would manifest with the same type of diarrhea but progressive in symptomatology and severity. Some other symptoms would also develop, such as fever, Nausea and vomiting, other nonspecific gastrointestinal symptoms, including signs of dehydration, uh, electrolyte imbalance, and 
all other GI disturbances that you would expect from a patient with diarrhea. In fact, cryptosporidiosis is the most common gastrointestinal infection causing diarrhea in HIV AIDS patients. The diagnosis of cryptosporidium is primarily through microscopy using quinone modified acid fast stain. Of course, you have to look at the patient's stools and you have to look for the presence of sporulated oocysts. This is very quick and very easy. Uh, a lot of laboratories would have this particular technique, which makes diagnosis relatively simple. Another way to diagnose is through enzyme immunoassays. And using this technique, it uses the serum rather than the stool sample of potential patients. It visualizes the immunoglobulins associated with cryptosporidium infections. You can also do your uh, microplate assay, like an ELISA plate or an ELISA well. The detection rates really vary and are influenced by a lot of factors, including the species of protozoans, the immunity status of patients, previous infections to cryptosporidium, infectious dose exposed to, and also the presence of symptoms associated with cryptosporidiosis. So just as a summary, cryptosporidium hominis would elicit a stronger response, previous infections lead to greater IgG response, and of course, greater infection or, or presence of symptoms would also lead to greater detection rates. As for the treatment of cryptosporidium, there is no effective drug yet, but these drugs have often been used in outbreaks with marginal success. This includes nitazoxanide, paramomycin, clarithromycin, and erythromycin, but the efficacy of this, these second-tier drugs are really not that well established. It should also be noted that these drugs are just effective for immunocompetent individuals. So how do you prevent and control cryptosporidiosis? According to the Centers for Disease Control, for immunocompromised patients, you have to always wash your hands. Practice safer sex, which includes the use of barrier methods, personal hygiene, and Limitation of anal oral sex. Third recommendation is to avoid touching farm animals, especially young farm animals. Number four, avoid touching stools of pets, especially stools of young pets. If you have to clean the stools of your pets, always wear gloves and dispose of them properly. Be very careful, especially when you are touching diarrheic stools or the stools of strays. Number five, avoid swallowing water when swimming. This holds true when you're swimming in private pools, public pools, even polluted oceans, where cryptosporidium cysts have been known to live in salt water for up to several days, and even just lolling through your own personal hot, hot tubs or jacuzzis. Wash and cook your food properly. Not consume unpasteurized daily products. Be careful where you buy your food. Make sure the food handlers wear safety equipment and they wash their hands well since some food handlers may be carriers of cryptosporidium. And of course, always drink safe water. So how do you ensure that you are drinking safe water? According again to the Centers for Disease Control, you have to practice rolling boil to one minute. You have to make sure that when you are boiling your water, you let it bubble up fully for at least one minute. Store and use water in the refrigerator as much as possible and always clean your ice trays and your water jars with soap and clean water regularly. As far as water filters are concerned, this is a public service announcement. If you're buying your water filters, please make sure that you have at least one of these recommended features as specifications for your water filters. You have your reverse osmosis, absolute one micron or even smaller, ANSI standard 53 or NSF 58, plus cyst removal or reduction. Cryptosporidium is distributed globally. However, in third world countries, it is not really that recognized as there are a lot of other diarrheic infections occurring in, in these countries. But in first world countries, it is not uncommon to be reported primarily as outbreaks. As examples, you have outbreaks occurring within water purification plants, water parks, a water treatment plant, 
and another water park. The largest documented waterborne disease outbreak in U.S. history happened in the Milwaukee Water Purification Plant in 1993, wherein about 400,000 people were affected and about 100 people died from cryptosporidium infections. More recently, I found this report. More than 100 people sickened in Arizona cryptosporidium parasite outbreak. This is in August 20th of 2016. If you take a look at this slide, you can see that majority of the cryptosporidium outbreaks happen in recreational water facilities. About half of waterborne diseases from chlorinated swimming pools are actually cryptosporidium related, and this is due to their chlorine resistant cysts. You can also see that a big chunk of infections are due to water treatment plant contaminations, which I gave you a few examples earlier. And another point is that a significant chunk, around 15%, is due to exposure to farm animals, primarily cattle. This is due to cryptosporidium parvum zoonotic epidemics. And that ends this particular topic. For the next part of this lecture, we will be talking about cyclospora. Thanks for watching, and see you then. If you learned something, feel free to share this video to someone who might find it useful. And don't stop learning.